Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another virtual event hosted by UC Press. With this time, we're co-hosting it with Arabic Literature and Translation uh, blog, uh, founded by Marsha Squaley. She's one of our panelists and moderator today. And welcome for tonight's talk about the English edition of I Do Not Sleep, okay? The novel by the late Egyptian writer Ehsan Abdul Qudus, uh, who is one of the greatest uh, Egyptian writers of the 20th century. And this novel, the English translation, just came out this month actually worldwide. You can purchase your copy from the nearest bookstore or online book retailers. I'm Suzanne Inewi, and I'm a at AUC Press and Bookstores. And our event tonight will take around one hour or so, and we're going to have a QA at the end. So make sure to type your questions in the QA box at the bottom of your screens, uh, because if you put it in the chat, we might miss it. And for our viewers on Facebook, you can write in your comments on the uh, Facebook Live, and we're going to put it here uh, for Marsha to ask to our uh, panelists. Um, the event, as I said, is broadcasted live on Facebook on our page and will be available after the event on Facebook at the American University in Cairo Press and also on our YouTube channel. So we're very excited to be hosting tonight's event and talking about this exciting novel. But let me first introduce um, our panelists for tonight. Um, we have Jonathan Smolin. He is the uh, Jane and Raphael Bernstein Professor in Asian Studies at Dartmouth College in the US. He is the author of Moroccan Noir, Police, Crime, and Politics in Popular Culture, published in 2013. And he's the translator of several works of Arabic fiction, and he is the translation of the English edition of I Do Not Sleep. Then we have Marsha Links Quayley. She is uh, the founding editor of Arabic, Arab Lit and Arab Lit Quarterly. And she's the co-host of the Bulak uh, Bot podcast. Uh, and her translations of Sonia Nim's Time Traveling Thunderbird trilogy and Haya Saleh Young Adult novel Wild Poppies are forthcoming in 22 and 23 as well. So congratulations on the forthcoming translations. And last but not least, we have Sharif uh, Abdul Qudus who is an independent uh, journalist based in Cairo. And for eight years, he worked as a producer and correspondent for the TV uh, radio news hour, Democracy Now. And in 2011, he returned to Egypt to cover the revolution. And since then, he has reported from across the region for a number of print and broadcast outlets. He received an Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media for his coverage of the Egyptian revolution and an Emmy Award for his coverage of Trump's Muslim ban. He is currently an editor and reporter at Bala Masr. And most importantly, he's the grandson of our prolific writer, Ehsan Abdul Kudus. You could see the similarity in the names, of course. Um, we're gonna move now to Marsha, who's gonna moderate tonight's event. Marsha, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so excited about this. Um, not only is Ehsan one of the, you know, the most popular Egyptian novelist of the 20th century, um, this is just an extremely fun book that I encourage everyone listening to pick up a copy of and read. And so we wanted to start actually <clears throat> with a reading that Sharif will do, but very briefly, Jonathan, if you could kind of give us the, uh, this context of, of when the, the, uh, the novel began appearing in serialization, how people might have received that because of this, um, the way it was placed. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you all for, for being here. I'm delighted to have the chance to talk about this. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what might not be obvious from the novel is that Ehsan was the editor in chief of the most popular magazine uh, uh, in Egypt at the time named Rosa Yusuf. And uh, for at least a decade before this novel was published, uh, writers, uh, in particular women would write into the magazine asking for his advice, typically about matters of love or uh, marriage or uh, family. And they would begin these letters with dear Ihsan, and then they would write their letter and he would write a response uh, typically. And so this is the, um, you know, this novel was serialized week in and week out in that magazine, uh, starting in late in fall of 1955. And this was a, a, a form that many readers um, were very familiar with, but also 
uh, many of them accidentally thought that this was real, that this was not fiction, but that this was a real letter to Ihsan that was being serialized. Um, and we know this from the letters that the magazine was publishing, um, people wanting to, to meet Nadia and, uh, and have the opportunity <laughs> to, uh, to maybe, maybe uh, uh, propose. So this is the kind of immediate context for the, 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 the novel as a letter. Excellent. So Sharif, if you would go ahead and read us from the beginning. Sure. And thanks very much for having me and for uh, putting out this translation. So my grandfather almost always started books with a little quote. Uh, this one starts, I'm both good and evil because I'm human. These are the, this is the opening. Dear Ahsen, I'm Nadia Lotfi. You don't know me, even if I did turn your head both times you saw me. Once on Sidi Bishra Beach in Alexandria, and another time at the Semiramis Hotel in Cairo. Each time I didn't pay much attention to you, as I'd gotten used to turning men's heads. I've been writing you this letter or notebook for three months. I never meant to write you such a long story, my story. All I meant to ask you, all I meant to ask you was a single question. Does God exist? But I realized it was a ridiculous question. I really do feel the existence of God. Terror fills me whenever I mention him. I even spent years praying five times a day, wrapping a white veil around my head, wearing a white shirt that rose up to my neck with long sleeves hanging down by my sides whenever I stood praying like an angel being conducted to heaven, to the unknown, to God. Yes, I'm convinced that God exists so convinced that it made my, my pen tremble as I wrote those words doubting his existence, tremble from fear. And here I am repeating to myself, I take refuge in God the Magnificent. I take refuge in God the Magnificent. Maybe I wanted to ask you, what is God? Yes, what is God? Tell me. God is truth, virtue, and goodness, since the prophets couldn't have called us to worship deception, sin, and evil. He's the powerful one, since the people of the earth couldn't have united to worship a weak God with no power or strength. So why does the powerful truth leave us to practice weak deception? Why does virtue abandon us to sin? Why is evil victorious over goodness in us? Tell me, why? Tell me, what is God then? I was told that God the Almighty created us, that he created our intellect and will so we could distinguish between good and evil. And, he, and that he left us in life to put our behavior to the test, like an exam. Whoever passes has paradise, and whoever fails has hell. I was told this. I tried to be convinced, but I wasn't. There can't be a ministry of education in heaven that gives us sheets of questions and then takes the answers to give them to committees for grading. And then suppose that I failed the test. Who'd be responsible? My ignorant mind and weak will. And who put this ignorant mind in my head and furnished me with this weak will? Who created me like this? God. God is the one responsible for me failing the test of heaven. How can I be punished for a crime for which I'm not responsible? How can I be burned for sin I didn't commit simply because heaven oppressed me by giving me a limited mind and weak will? No, a thousand times no. This can't be God. God doesn't need to give people a test because he's known them ever since he created them. He's too merciful to leave them to a fight in which they're torn between good and evil. He's not like the Roman emperors who used to let lions loose on their subjects to be entertained by the sight of the battle between wild animals and men, by the sight of blood spilled in the Colosseum. He's God, the merciful, the compassionate. He's love and peace. There has to be another explanation. There has to be another explanation for good and evil for heaven and hell, for the scales of judgment in heaven? Or have I become an infidel? I feel my heart pound. I feel as if there's another woman inside me slapping her cheeks, screaming and wailing as if she's throwing me down the well. I repeat again, I take refuge in God the Magnificent. I take refuge in God the Magnificent. God will no doubt forgive me since he knows that he didn't push me to all this questioning and doubt, and that I'm a victim of myself which always defeated me and always pushed me to evil, to sin. Yes, dear sin, I'm evil. I'm hooked on evil. 
So those are just the opening lines of I Do Not Sleep. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shiri, for reading that. Um, so Jonathan, if you could then give us just so, so we know that this novel was serialized. So this is the first segment, the first thing that's, that people are reading. And this, you know, uh, publication that they're, they're maybe purchasing for other things too, right? Um, so this is not, it's not like buying a dedicated novel. If you could just tell us a bit about how it appeared and how he, you know, how he worked, as you pointed out to me, each of these chapters is, you know, pretty standard because it appears serialized. Absolutely. Um, and so it's easy to, for, easy to forget, but uh, his real job was as a journalist and as an editor of the magazine. And so he spent uh, all week, uh, all day working on this magazine. And also during this time uh, was when they were uh, getting ready to launch another magazine that was called Sabah Khair. And here's a, 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 an image of the very first one. And this magazine um, came out in January 1st, 1956. Um, and so during this time, he was incredibly busy. Um, and he had many acquaintances, many people would come through his, his office. Um, and so he wrote uh, multiple times about the way that it was very hard for him to find time to write fiction. And that writing fiction for him was a kind of escape. It was a kind of therapy. And he would typically write the fiction on Friday nights in his office once he had finished the deadlines and all the copy for Rosa Youssef. That's what he would go and write the fiction. And the thing that is, and, and write the installment for that week. And it was due the following morning. It was due uh, very early the next morning. And so it's, it's incredible to me um, as a scholar of, 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 a scholar of modern Arabic fiction and of his work that every chapter that he wrote was written in a, you know, a few hours when he finally got some peace from the week in his office uh, hours before the deadline for the magazine. That, that doesn't mean that he didn't have a roadmap in his mind for what the novel was going to be and where the plot was going to go. But uh, he did not work with drafts. He did not revise. He did not write the whole thing and then serialize it. He wrote week in and week out, Friday nights, stayed in the office until he finished, and then sent the, the magazine to the press, uh, to the printer to be published. That's just crazy to me. But uh, I mean, because even uh, Charles Dickens wrote in, in something of a similar manner, but not in a, this condensed like couple of hours. Uh, he must have at least been cogitating on it. Uh, Absolutely. And, and deadlines are a powerful thing, right? Right. <laughs> but it, it really is incredible. And so um, each chapter, of course, is, is part of a, it's, it's serialized that they, you know, he wants people to come back for the next week. And so that's why his fiction has this feeling of each chapter ending with a kind of cliffhanger to, to get people to come the next week. Um, and so that element of, of the serialization is very, very important, as is his language, as is the kind of quick, snappy, almost cinematic language. He was someone who worked very, very hard to try to popularize fiction and to, to, to use his magazine in a way to, not, to build audiences, not just for the media, but for fiction as well. Right. Um, so Sharif, I wanted to ask you, um, because in addition to being this massively popular novelist who's some, what was it, 50, of his books were turned into films. Um, he was also a journalist and in many ways working in the footsteps of his mother, Rosa Youssef, um, and, and who was also a sort of an entertainer and a journalist. And I wondered how you see your work as a journalist fitting into this sort of family business or family legacy. Um. Well, for one thing, I've been able uh, to travel across the Arab world these last 10 years in my capacity as a journalist and uh, covering stories. And I'm still amazed that wherever I go, uh, you know, Palestine, Yemen, uh, Syria, Libya, people are fascinated to learn that I'm the grandson of Hassan Abdel Quddus when they inquire about my name. Um, it continues to happen here all the time at the airports when I arrive or if I'm doing any official business and they see my full name, they ask if I'm related to the Hassan. So it's incredible the breadth of this recognition that he retains, uh, you know, over 30 years after he died. 
but but more importantly, the more I read about him and my great grandmother Rosa Yusuf, and how they both used their journalism as a way to challenge uh, authority, as a way to instigate change, uh, the more fascination I have for them, and I feel imbued with a, a sense of pride to be linked uh, to both of them and to have that family lineage. Um, you know, my own identity in journalism was forged at Democracy Now!, which is an independent outlet uh, based in New York, which has at the very core of its philosophy to be truly independent, uh, to shun establishment orthodoxy, to speak truth to power, to give voice to the marginalized. And I've always tried to keep those principles in mind in my journalism. And when I read about my, my grandfather and my great grandmother's lives uh, and their work and, and how they so closely embodied uh, those principles, um, it endlessly fascinates me and in fact, makes me feel closer to them. Um, I'm nowhere near uh, their stature or talents or impact, but it nevertheless makes me feel like I'm carrying something forward um, in the family legacy. And there's just so many stories and kind of historical episodes that I find incredibly compelling. Um, one that I became a little obsessed with a few years ago and researched thoroughly, although I haven't written about it yet, is the case of Jacinto Fee. Um, Jacinto Fee was this young militant anti-British nationalist who in 1946 assassinated Amin Osman, who was uh, this very pro-British um, finance minister. So Jacinto Fee was arrested uh, along with a few others implicated in the plot, including Anwar Sadet. And they were part of this very high profile trial at the time. And Jacinto Fee somehow managed to escape from prison at some point. And the entire security apparatus in Egypt was looking for him and the radio was blaring every half hour that there's a 5,000 pound bounty on his head and um, also issuing threats that anyone who harbored him was an accomplice in a crime whose punishment was death. And it was then that my grandfather received the call uh, late at night from a friend asking him to come immediately to meet him. And he you know, got in his car and sped through the streets of Cairo at night and met him and found himself face to face with Jacinto Fee, this man that everyone was looking for. And uh, whereupon he offered to hide Jacinto Fee in his house, uh, an incredibly risky thing to do. Uh, he brought him back to his house on Osirlaini Street with my grandmother. And there he hid and slept in my grandfather's bed uh, for several days. And it was only when um, my grandmother thought that the cook had spotted Jacinto Fee in the bedroom somehow and was afraid they would expose them that they called their revolutionary colleagues and Jacinto Fee was taken to another hiding place. But this story formed um, the basis of my grandfather's novel, for Baituna Rogun, There's a Man in Our House, that was later adapted into a film that's a classic of Egyptian cinema, starring Omar Sharif and Roshdi Abaza and Zivida Sarwat. So it's just fascinating. And, and the apartment on Osulaini Street, uh, where all this happened, um, was recently acquired again by our family and I was able to visit it and see where, where this took place. And it's really Im imbued with this incredible history. And it's a history, I think, that, that resonates uh, today with our collective experiences, especially with the 2011 revolution and all the moments of, of struggle and resistance and imprisonment and heroism uh, that came with it. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, you know, the defeat as well. And, and just very quickly, another kind of, uh, sorry, I've gone on for a bit long. But another kind of nugget I found very striking uh, resonated with me as well as a journalist was um, when my great grandmother Rosal Yusuf handed over the reins of the magazine to her son Hassan when he was just 26 years old and he had been briefly imprisoned in August of 1945 for writing an article calling for the ouster of Lord Killern who was the British ambassador and basically the person in charge of the country at the time. And after he was released, Rosal Yusuf decided that Hassan had passed through the experience that every chief editor at the magazine had passed through, which is prison. And so um, she handed over the reins to him. And in an October uh, 1945 issue of the magazine, she publishes this note addressed uh, from a mother to her son from one generation to the next. It's titled 20 Years of Waiting. And she, in it, she gives a number of points of advice. And it's just incredible. She tells him things like, uh, reject arrogance in the face of uh, fame because arrogance is deadly. Always be curious and open to learning. Uh, consider your conscience before your wallet and fight oppression wherever you see it and be with the weak against the strong, no matter the cost. 
So it's these episodes that I read about that are laden with so much meaning and resonance uh, for me that I, I find so special. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, so part of this letter appears in Ruff Cormac, who is here in, in this room today in his Midnight in Cairo. And it's, it's very moving uh, uh, transition between mother and son. Um, so uh, Jonathan, speaking of prison and, and, and publication and all these things, and uh, Suzanne, if you could show the, um, the images uh, during this next question. So um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about the relationship between Hassan's fiction, his journalism, and this, I don't know if we can call it activism or his vision for the future of the country in general and specifically when it came to this novel. Absolutely. So um, Hassan was intensely political. I mean, his uh, if you go back and look at his earliest uh, editorials, uh, um, starting in, in, frankly, the early 1940s, he, uh, he's writing um, editorials that are really quite inflammatory, that are um, attacking the political elite for being corrupt, for calling for a, a, a wiping away of the old political guard that has corrupted the country calling for revolution in ways that were really quite shocking at the time and certainly got him in trouble in the way that uh, Sharif is pointing to. And, uh, and so his political activities were, um, you know, in a sense, part and parcel with the magazine. And, and, uh, and, and this, this activity didn't stop with the 1952 revolution. He, when um, he was uh, deeply concerned about the direction of the, the country and uh, the way that the country had moved away from democracy, which was um, uh, why he had supported the free officers to begin with, why he had supported the, the coup and the revolution was, was to embed democracy in the country. Uh, in March, 1954, he, wrote a series of editorials um, that were incredibly inflammatory against the free officers and called for them to leave, um, uh, basically to return to the barracks and, uh, and called for a, 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 a real political process in the country. And he was jailed for that in, in ways that were really quite different from the ways that he was jailed in the 1940s. This was a time in which he was, uh, this time uh, he was in jail for, for three months. Um, he uh, was in uh, bad conditions. He was, uh, it was a, a terrible experience. And so when he left jail in the summer of 1954, this is really when his fiction changes dramatically. This is when he becomes the Hassan that, that we, we know and love as a, as a novelist. And so um, his fiction at this point really skyrockets, not just in the amount that he's writing, but the, the quality and, and the, 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 the sensationalism of it. But unfortunately, up to this point, scholars and, and, and people who have appreciated his fiction just assumed that after he left jail, he stopped being political, that he, because he wasn't contesting the free officers in uh, his editorials anymore in Rosa Youssef, there's, just, there's this idea that his fiction was, was detached from politics. And uh, in, in the book that I'm finishing right now about Ihsan, I'm making the argument that nothing could be further from the truth, is that he used fiction as a way, um, uh, as, as a, um, a way that wasn't necessarily as direct and obvious as his editorials, but he used fiction in intensely political ways. Um, and he said many times from the 1970s on, uh, when I write editorials, I'm writing fic, or when I write, um, when I write uh, editorials, I'm writing fiction. And when I write fiction, I'm writing politics. And for some reason, People didn't listen to that. They that he's never been read in this way. Um, that his fiction uh, was was became his political contestation, became the way he challenged the state. And he had a particularly unique position that Gamal Abdel Nasser loved to read him and read him week in and week out. And there are times where it's obvious that he, at least to me, that he's writing to Gamal Abdel Nasser in this week's. Uh, uh, section in this week's chapter, um, knowing that Gamal is reading him. Uh, Nasser did not read 
at least as far as we know, he wasn't someone who read books, but he loved the press. And Rosa Yusuf was something that he read uh, very, very closely. Um, and so, uh, uh, so I, I just think that the way that, um, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't stop uh, the, the being political and he didn't stop the kind of uh, political uh, uh, contestation that he uh, did in the 1940s and early 1950s, um, just because he stopped doing that in his editorials. He did it in his fiction. Right, and your suggestion is that this particular novel is uh, uh, underneath the surface ab about the coup. That's right. Um, and so uh, he, he returns to this basic theme again and again in one form or another. Uh, it's a kind of family drama of one form or another, another in which there's a uh, in which someone uh, that someone has accidentally embedded a traitor, um, embedded someone that is abusing the narrator or abusing the central female character, and this 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 happens again and again in his fiction. It becomes a kind of obsession. It's like he's trying to tell the public um, uh, that. Um, uh, his his unhappiness about the, the 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 politics of Egypt in the 1950s and 60s through this metaphor of of uh, a trade of, of of accidentally embedding a traitor into the fabric of the household and not being able to change that um, and uh, uh, this novel uh, very strongly. Uh, points to that and very strongly suggests the reading that it is a retelling of the 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 um, the nineteen forties the the, uh, the colonialism and a retelling of um, of uh, Ehsan's experience with the free officers before nineteen fifty two and a retelling of uh, his I think what haunted him a sense of accidentally embedding Nasser in power. Right. And uh, thank you, Suzanne, for sharing these very racy images, some of which were published originally as it was serialized, and some of these are from, from the book. Um, so, Shirif, I wanted to ask you um, how you remember your grandfather and uh, how you remember him being a part of the family and people talking about him and sort of the life around him as you were growing up. Um, well, my grandfather, uh, he died on January 11th, uh, 1990. So today actually marks the 32nd anniversary of his passing. Um, and I was 11 years old at the time. And I remember that it was the scale of the funeral that first made me really understand how prominent of a figure he was. Uh, I understood to a degree at the time that he was well known. Um, but at the funeral, I remember they, they closed down Gabalea Street in Zamelik in front of the building where he lived, which is the main thoroughfare. And I stood in the receiving line uh, with my father, uncle, uh, my cousin, and my older brother. And there were just hundreds and hundreds of mourners uh, coming through and shaking our hands. And to my 11-year-old mind, uh, that was something quite compelling to behold. And you know, my uncle still lives in the same apartment. Um, the family moved there in 1960 from that place in Osulaini Street. And since his death 32 years ago, uh, hardly anything's changed in the apartment. It's like a museum. And so there is this sense of, of, of his legacy always there. His study where he wrote is as it was exactly with his desk. There's even still, um, you know, the inkwell and the ink blotter and other items on the desk. There's this massive painting behind the chair where he sat um, that hangs and it's of a, a man in a shirt being uh, crucified. Uh, that's quite striking. Um, and there's so much history in that room. There's the tin cup uh, that he had in his cell when he was imprisoned by Nasser in 1954. There's photographs everywhere. There's an entire wall of books. Um, it's really something, but my personal memories of him are, are, are fragmented, but, but some of them are indelible. I mean, I remember that in every room of the house, there was kind of his chair, his spot where he sat and that no one else should sit there. Um, I remember him going into his study and shutting the door and uh, we couldn't be loud near there and he wouldn't emerge for a long time. I actually remember him once shouting from his study, asking my father for a French man's name and my father yelled back, Pierre. And it must have been for one of his stories, but that's one of those strange memories that stuck. 
um, you know, I remember being on our family plot in Montserrat and sitting in the garden with him and sometimes kicking a football around. He always had uh, this kind of ubiquitous cigar that was always there and he had this amazing large smile. And I also remember a little better because it was when I was a little older, uh, the, the period before he died. Um, he had suffered a stroke in 1988 and we, he went to Virginia for a procedure in 1989 uh, that went very badly and he slipped into a coma. We visited him there in Virginia and he came out of the coma, but after he came back, he was much frailer and he appeared to have aged suddenly, very rapidly. Um, and we were all on an Al cruise at the end at, uh, for New Year's um, in 1989. And I only vaguely, very vaguely remember snapshots of this. But um, a couple of hours before midnight on New Year's Eve, he suffered a massive stroke uh, and never regained consciousness. Um, and I remember seeing him in hospital uh, for the last time hooked up to these machines and, and he died on January 11th. But uh, you know, mostly I remember him being a loving grandfather which is what he was to me and how I knew him. And it was only later uh, that I began to understand and discover the incredible life that he led. And that process became very special to me when I embarked on my own career as a journalist. Thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, why Nadia is sleepless. Um, and I started to think about this a lot it, because of Hizem al um uh, Kitab al Nom, you know, that, that also in this 2013 period puts sleep forward um, as such like an important state. So why is Nadia sleepless? What is this insomnia? What, what is this about? Great. I, and, and also, I just wanted to go back to a second for the, the, the comments that I was making. I don't mean to take away from the fiction, the, the literary quality, the entertainment quality of the fiction. Um, even though I believe it is intensely political, what made him such a, uh, you know, a master writer was the way that, in a sense, he was able to hide that in a great plot, in a great storytelling, in great language that brought people back week in and week out for the next installment. Um, but as far as the idea of sleeplessness, you know, when I uh, was doing the research for the, the book that I'm finishing about his life and career, I went back and read everything. I mean, I went and read everything. I read all of his editorials uh, from this period, I, I, and I aligned them with the chapters. And when you do that, you have a very different view of the, the symbolism or what it is that he's trying to get across politically with each chapter, because these are intensely tied to um, you know, the, the editorials that he's writing week in, week out in the, the, the kind of political events of the week or of the month. Um, and so one of the things that was interesting was that in the time that he was uh, preparing this, because he would write sometimes in, in the, the, the magazine and say, I'm preparing my latest novel, I've got the plot, you know, you're going to see it soon. Right around this time, he writes an editorial about how he cannot sleep, about how he is suffering from, from insomnia. And that he tries again and again uh, to try to, to, he tries a, ver a variety of different ways to, to, to sleep. He writes about how he would sit in the living room and listen to records, about how he would read the Quran, about how he would go into his son's room and, 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 and snuggle with them in bed, um, uh, but he could not sleep. And one of the things that was, was clear was that he was suffering from a sense of anxiety. And sometimes he wasn't very open about this, but um, in some ways he was most open about this by the characters in his novels. Um, and so in this respect, Nadia in this text um, could be read as a, a, a first person, um, or partly as a, as a narration of Ihsan, of the anxieties that he was feeling, of the insomnia that he was feeling. Um, he didn't talk about this too much, but he did uh, uh, admit that when he wrote 
I'm Free, which was the classic that was published in 1953 um, and has a, uh, a female character, um, a female uh, lead character, uh, he did talk about how this was him, that he put himself in the novel as a female character. Um, he never talked about the later novels in this way, but I think it was the, the start of a trend for him where, in a sense, the female characters in these texts represent a fusion of not just the own fictional, not just only the fictional character, but the things that he uh, were on his mind and, and the things that he was uh, grappling with. Um, and so in that respect, he talked a lot about, he wrote a lot about fiction as therapy. Um, the idea that uh, fiction of writing, of being by himself, of being lost in the fiction was a kind of therapy for him. And it was the way that he found peace and the way that he was able to grapple with the things that were making him anxious. Um, and so the, the text itself represents this. In other words, the novel is the, is the product of uh, uh, an experience of self-therapy, I think, for him. Hmm. So another thing I wanted to, uh, that uh, another way in which it sort of leaps out of fiction into the world is that, I mean, Nadia Lotfi becomes a real person yes. when um, a young woman named Paula renames herself Nadia Lotfi uh, after the, the film character. And then there's the relationship between the book and the film. And you've said that people sort of sometimes misremember the book, giving it the... Uh, the not as depressing ending as this, not as troubling, you know, not as de-sleepifying as the, right. the, the book. As, um, and so, you know, as, as we mentioned in the beginning, some 50 uh, classics of Egyptian cinema were based on his fiction of one form or another. I've got two of them, the posters behind me, uh, the I Do Not Sleep, and, and then uh, My Father's Up a Tree uh, to, uh, on the other side. Um, but again and again and again in the 1950s and 60s, his, the endings of his novels that I think were intensely political got sanitized in the films and they got transformed. They got, um, the, in a sense, almost transformed to the exact opposite of what the meaning, of, at least of, of the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 ending of the novels, basically, almost like the exact opposite. And so uh, he wrote many times about how he, he hated watching his films, that he hated seeing what, were, what was done to them, that he felt that um, once he signed the contract, he had nothing to do with it. Um, and this is the, the case, at least, you know, this is a classic of Egyptian cinema, but the ending of the, of the film is totally different from the ending of the novel. Um, at the end of the film, Nadia is punished for her treason. Um, Nadia is, you know, punished for her plotting. She is burned. Uh, and, you know, her dress catches fire at the end and she confesses what she did to the father. Um, and the, the father forgives her and, and it's all happily ever after. Um, and for, I don't want to ruin the ending of the novel, but this is not how the novel ends. Right. The novel is troubling. <laughs> and leaves you in a troubled position. Um, Shidif, I wanted to ask you which of your grandfather's novels you read first and, um, and how, how you read it then and how your understanding of his literary work has changed or not changed over the years. Well, actually growing up, my proficiency in reading Arabic was quite poor. Um, this was the result of being schooled exclusively in English and you know, Arabic kind of fell by the wayside. And this, of course, was, you know, a source of embarrassment for me in many ways for a long time, not only for the fact that I'm Egyptian and, you know, kind of all the uh, colonial and neo-colonial neo complications that come with being that and unable to speak or properly access the language of one's motherland, but even more so because I'm the grandson of one of the most popular Arabic writers of the 20th century. And I was also a very avid reader of fiction growing up and, and remained so. And so this always felt like some kind of absence. Um, but I remember when I was a boy, there was one translation of Anna Horra, I Am Free, uh, that did come out and I read it then. Um, but even then I could tell that it was a very poor translation. The English was, was not very good. However, um, since um, returning to Egypt um, over 10 years ago and through my work as a journalist, I've made a concerted effort. And now I, my reading skills in Arabic are much better. 
Uh, and it's actually one of the first books I read cover to cover in Arabic was uh, Rosal Youssef's memoir. Um, and, you know, reading is this uh, amazing technology, right? That it allows through just some markings on a page for a person's voice to be in your head and the person speaks to you. So it was this, it was fascinating for the first time to have her voice in my head for the first time, my great grandmother. Um, but the first book I read of my grandfather's was actually a, a series of articles that was compiled into a book in, uh, in the 1980s. It, it's called Ala Ahwa Shara Siyasi, Ala Ahwa Shara Siyasi. And it's basically structured as a conversation between an older man and a younger man sitting uh, in an Ahwa in a cafe speaking about politics. And this was the first book I read because I was very kind of hungry for his direct political views. I, I didn't want the metaphor at the time. Uh, this was, you know, when the 2011 revolution was in, in full swing. Um, and it was really in, intriguing to see how he was able to navigate back and forth between kind of the righteous and militant and revolutionary convictions of uh, the young versus the more nuanced and yet safer political calculations of the old. So it was kind of very insightful. Um, and I've read a couple of his shorter novels uh, since, but actually the translation of L'Anem, I Do Not Sleep, is the first time I kind of read him properly in English. And I have access to that in a different way in my brain. Uh, and it's opened some pathways for me to read him in a way and, and think about his writing. I mean, there's kind of a breathlessness to the prose um, that, I, that I, I can't kind of uh, appreciate in the same way in Arabic. So I'm very grateful to Jonathan for translating this in AC press for, for putting the book out. But actually I wanted to ask Jonathan a question if, if I could, um, you know, his relationship with Abdel Nasser is something that endlessly kind of fascinates me. They're extremely close. Uh, he was kind of instrumental in the 1952 coup and called, you know, to the barracks on the morning of the coup. And then, you know, as we described, he's eventually jailed by him. And, and I wonder if you could just say that story of what happened between him and Abdel Nasser right after he came out. But also when you came to visit here, you went to the Gamal Abdel Nasser Museum, which actually is right off Hassan Abdel Qudus Street. Um, and in there you, you found, you saw Fubaytun Aragul, one of his books, and in there he had endorsed uh, to Abdel Nasser. And he's, I forgot what he said, something, you know, the great leader and a great friend or something. And this is the man who imprisoned him and, you know, who you say is uh, kind of this eternal source of guilt that he brought him he brought this traitor kind of into the house. Uh, so if you could just kind of talk about that, that complicated relationship between the two men. I, I think they had an incredibly complicated relationship. I mean, just to give you a sense of this, um, when uh, Hassan was jailed, when Nasser jailed him in, in the summer of 1954, uh, when he got out, um, he, he went right home. And as soon as he got home, the phone rang. And he thought, oh, this must be my mother calling to check on me. Uh, and he picked up the phone and it was Nasser. And Nasser said to him, so Ihsan, have you learned your lesson yet? And Ihsan didn't know what to say. And then Nasser said, well, come to my house right now and we'll, we'll talk. And so instead of having the opportunity to spend time with his family, he had to go to Nasser's house. And, uh, and this was a, a, an entire month where he had to go every day um, for lunch and to watch a movie. Nasser was, was of course a, a great lover of cinema and they would project a movie on his tennis court. And, um, and so he was forced to sit and have lunch with Nasser uh, for an entire month. And, and after a month, he said, to, uh, he said to Nasser, why are you doing this? Why are you inviting me here every day? And Nasser said to him, because I'm giving you psycho psychoanalysis, because I'm giving you therapy, because I'm your, I'm your psychologist. And that, that kind of psychological relationship between them was incredibly rich. One of the things that's a challenge about Nasser is that we have so much written about him, but we don't have much written that he wrote about other people. And so uh, in a sense, Nasser is a collage. He's a collage of how people interacted with him. But what we do know is that Nasser loved to humiliate people. And he found that this was a kind of uh, part of his, um, uh, of his um, kind of uh, political um, uh, modus operandi. And so um, what was clear was that he was intentionally trying to uh, insult and humiliate Ihsan. And so 
one of the things that I see in his fiction in the aftermath of this is in a sense, a, a, a message directly to Nasser through the fiction that you're not going to, you're not going to insult me. You're not gonna humiliate me. I'm going to do what I can in this fiction in order to tell what I had to say, what I have to say in order to be the same person that I am. Um, and again and again, he comes back to contest Nasser in the fiction uh, in ways that weren't widely known because his experience with the free officers was not widely known in Egypt. And his, his role in the buildup to the coup was also not widely known. Um, and so in many ways, it seems like he's writing for himself, but he's also writing directly for Nasser. And it's clear that Nasser, Nasser would have been able to read right through the symbolism and the metaphor. Um, and we know that Nasser read him closely and he got in trouble um, we, for uh, a, a, a wonderful, a um, uh, novel called Girls in the Summer um, that was uh, translated, uh, one of the sections was translated magnificently um, in uh, Banapal recently, um, was uh, he got in, uh, Nasser um, uh, uh, basically, you know, he thought he was going to be jailed for this again, and and uh, he had to find his way back into Nasser's good graces. There's a letter that he wrote to Nasser to try to, um, you know, prevent another jailing. Uh, this uh, similar thing happened in 1964 when he uh, published his magnificent novel A Nose and Three Eyes, um, and the, which is the next novel um, that uh, AUC will be publishing in translation. And uh, Hassan uh, has the honor of being the first novelist brought before parliament for harming public morality um, and was interrogated by the police for that novel as well. So I, I hope I'm answering your, your question, but it was a, a, re a relationship that is not, uh, that is, I think, um, recorded in the fiction and, um, and is, um, goes, it, it continues. It's not something that is just uh, easily set and easily, uh, it's something that is not resolved. If only so, we had Nasser's memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> or Hassan's memoirs as well, although you say his memoirs no. are everywhere. He said again, again and again in the 70s and 80s in interviews that, he's, that he gave, there's no point in me writing memoirs. It's all in my fiction. So um, I'm going to shift to some of the questions that we have and let people know that they can continue to add questions as we were talking. Um, apparently somebody on Facebook wanted to know, I'd be curious to know if he would have been friends with Nagim Mahfouz. He was, they grew up in the same area. They, but they both grew up in Abbasia and they were friends. They were childhood friends where they knew each other um, as kids, but they um, were very, very close um, in the, or close in the 1950s. Uh, Nagi Mahfouz wrote the screenplays for some of uh, Ihsan's films, um, and they stayed in very close, you know, close contact, certainly, you know, from literary and, and uh, journalistic circles um, throughout their lives. There's a wonderful, wonderful video of um, Ihsan coming to, to congratulate Nagi Mahfouz in 1988 for the Nobel Prize, and it is just a delightful video in, in, in how, um, how heartfelt the congratulations is. But you said that uh, Ihsan also sort of mocked Nagim Mahfouz gently for uh, you know, his more literary language of his novels. Absolutely. Right? So Ihsan is, 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 is an inheritor of the Nahda, of the 19th century Renaissance, of a simplification of the language, of the expansion of literacy, of, of disseminating Arabic on the broadest possible, you know, a readership on the broadest possible level. And so he purposely simplified his language and, uh, um, and, and in a sense sensationalized his language, which is why he's such a good um, uh, uh, um, writer to read for teaching advanced Arabic. And that's really how I discovered him. I, I had the best teacher of Arabic, uh, Farouk Mustafa at the University of Chicago long ago. And I learned to read Arabic by reading Ihsan's stories. Um, and and that's, that's how I learned. And, and, and it was Farouk who, who um, was in, in, long ago an impetus for um, for this translation and this work. 
Excellent. So the next question is, um, I believe from Walid, is why why translate Latinem into English first as opposed to any of his other novels? For example, I'm free. Thanks. Um, so I, uh, I think I'm free is, is an incredibly important classic of, of feminist literature and, and should absolutely be translated. But um, there was a period where I just I read everything, uh, all of the fiction from the 50s and 60s, very, you know, in, 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 in quick succession. And I just felt that I Do Not Sleep um, really was um, the, the, the one to start with because it's a great story. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a page turner and uh, it's from this period where he really begins to generate these classics. And it, it, you don't need to have any background in Egyptian history. There, it, the text is intensely political, but you can read it without knowing anything about the 50s and 60s about Nasser, about this, this period. Um, and so I thought the novel was, was uh, just a great read, a great work of literature, but also had this uh, amazing political um, uh, subtext that, that people who do have this background could, could understand. Um, I just wanna say that Kay says that Farouk thanks you. Uh, <laughs> um, so Fatin uh, Morsi also asked, also for you, Jonathan, sorry. Um, can you talk to us about some of the challenges in translating the text from Arabic to English? Uh, so I want to hide as a translator. I, I want to do everything I can to duplicate the experience of reading the novelist um, for uh, as if you were reading him in Arabic. Now, of course, it's, that's impossible in English. But I, I just work as hard as possible to make the text not read like a translation and reflect the style, the language, the language choices that the author would have made uh, themselves. Um, and uh, I do the best I can. <laughs> it's a very hard process. Excellent. So I just I, I, it's sort of a, I know we're sort of coming to the end of our of our time. I wanted to ask about I wanted to ask Jonathan uh, about and both of you, Jonathan and Sharif, about what is Ehsan's legacy, both his literary legacy and his, his legacy in journalism. Who did he pass the torch to? What, what, does he, um, what does he bring to, you know, how does he continue to live on now? Either yeah. one of you. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. I mean, for me, uh, uh, you know, I kind of kept kind of uh, discovering more and more uh, the richness of his experience and um, how committed he was to kind of principles that guided him uh, for most of his life, for, for his entire life, really. And um, for me, I think that the legacy lives, you know, the torch is passed not just to, if we think beyond kind of national boundaries, this torch is passed to kind of all journalists and all kind of um, writers who want to challenge uh, status quos and want to challenge orthodoxy and want to never fall uh, within kind of uh, established frameworks. And for me, that's endlessly inspiring. Um, and to be, I mean, also just, I don't understand how he wrote that much. And, we're, and you have to remember, this is also with a pen and paper, we even have computers now, it makes it so much easier, but the amount of output uh, is really quite staggering. And it always uh, compels me when I'm sitting down and watching a YouTube video or something that's, no, we should be writing. Um, <laughs> and, and so so I think, yeah, I think, you know, his legacy as a journalist is, is kind of legacy of what journalism should be in many ways, which is which is to, uh, to, to kind of challenge authority and to, uh, as his mother advised him, to stand with the weak against the strong. And as far as, you know, from my perspective, we can talk about his legacy as a writer. And uh, one reason why we haven't seen him translated into English up to this point, or at least in a way that is widely accessible, is that he was, he was a populist. He was someone who wrote popular fiction. And this is something that's been frankly ignored by scholars of literature, of scholars of Arabic or people who haven't taken him seriously as a writer. Um, and so in that respect, he, from my, I see him as 
the father of Egyptian popular fiction today. Um, I was, I was uh, you know, uh, honored to be good friends with uh, Ahmed Khal Tawfiq, who passed away, of course. And he is the, the kind of godfather of Egyptian uh, horror, fic horror uh, fiction. Um, but when I talked with him about this project, uh, you know, he was so enthusiastic and, and, and he, he would say things like, if you want to understand, you know, uh, Arabic popular fiction, you know, he is the one, he is the one who is, who, who needs, you know, who has to have this book written about him. And um, right now, if you go to any bookstore in Cairo, you're going to see tons and tons and tons of popular fiction. That is, fiction, you know, can be read and enjoyed um, for, uh, for uh, you know, enjoyment, for entertainment. And he is the father of that. Mm. And if you go to, say, see illegal downloads on 4Shared, you'll find that Sen is still, still up at the top. Yes. Um, so uh, I thank you guys both for your time. I think it's been uh, a wonderful hour that we've spent discussing Essen and this and this novel. Um, I really appreciate your time and appreciate AUC Press for for finally uh, bringing <laughs> this uh, out in in English. Well, thank you so much, Marsha, for moderating this. You did a wonderful job. And uh, I'm sure everyone who joined us enjoyed it as much as I did. So interesting to hear about the background story, about the history that it's not easily found or told. And uh, But also the novel is very exciting to read. And uh, we're so proud to be publishing the English translation. And hopefully um, we'll do more and more of these, as Johnson said. and. Uh, you can buy your copy of I Do Not Sleep electronically. You can find it online. You can buy it from online book retailers or major bookstores worldwide. And uh, please uh, let us know your reviews uh, when you find them on the different uh, online stores. Thank you, Sharif, and thank you, Johnson. Of course, again, thank you, Marsha, so much for your time. And thanks for everyone who joined us from all over the world. The recording of this event, you can find it afterwards on our Facebook channel and YouTube channel as well. Uh, thank you and thank you all. have thank you. a beautiful evening or day, depending on where you are. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.